Panelized podcast, Kyle here with Jeremiah and a special guest, a very special guest. Jeremiah, would you do an intro for me? We have one of the best cartoonists to ever do the game, been doing it for a long time, but he still hasn't lost any steps along the way. Best known for his work, Strangers in Paradise. He is an Eisner Award winning, Rubin Award winning, and Harvey Award winning artist, Mr. Terry Moore. How are you tonight? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me here. Thank you so much for coming on. We'll get right to the questions. And one thing that I'm really interested about is what is your infatuation with peanuts? The majority of your work doesn't seem like it comes out of Santa Rosa, California. <laughs> I know. And the peanuts that I loved came out of Minnesota. You know, the early stuff. And the kids lived in that neighborhood where there was snow and stuff. You know, I mean, that was kind of the peanuts world for me. One thing that I think, unless you were born in the 50s and kind of grew up with peanuts comics, you may not realize the setting of the world at the time, why Peanuts was so popular. It was there between wars, between World War II and the Cold War. And in the late 50s, Russia and America were getting very tense with each other. If you went to elementary school in the early 60s, you had bomb drills, what to do if an atomic bomb went off in the area where you had to put your head down uh, on the floor and kiss your ass goodbye and all that. That's kind of what sprouted all these beat poets about fatalism and the early rebellion music and stuff like that. Like it was kind of either we might as well party because we're all going to die tomorrow, maybe, or, you know, that kind of thing. In, in their own way, everybody was looking for escape. And in the 60s, I was a little kid. And his world was so much better than my world. You know, the Peanuts world, I wanted to live in their neighborhood. Then you turn on the news and it's the news guy saying, you know, we're at the atomic clock, doomsday clock is one minute to midnight. Then you go look at Peanuts and their biggest problem was his kites in the tree. And on the surface, it looks like, you know, I have this daily frustration with, uh, you know, doing any sports or kites. I'm just the kid who can't win. But all of it was a metaphor. I mean, if you were at Harvard Law School, you could read that and see that it was it was a metaphor for everything going on in America. But if you were there and saw the setting of the piece, it's kind of like, why are the Beatles such a big deal? Because now there's like a million Beatles somethings, you know? But at the time, you have to look at, they were the only ones there doing that. Everybody else was like Tony Bennett and Frank Sinatra. And then they were it, you know, they were like the only metal band there was, the only rock group there was. They were the only shredders on the entire music scene. <laughs> so it was kind of like that. And it, Peanuts was like that. Everything else was sappy, you know, high and lowest and old, old joke. But Charles Schultz managed to capture that tense fatalism of, I don't know if I have tomorrow, you know, we really don't. You know, so it, it was just kind of cool. And in the midst of all that, he saw, he was making the point, look, what's really important is enjoying the moment and look at the flower. And then Linus was there saying, look at the pretty clouds. And maybe as the bomb drops, that's your last thought. Look at the beautiful clouds. So his Peanuts was very deep on that level. And now reading it 70 years later, it just looks dated and all that, you know. So it was a product of its time. It's the reason why we still know Litz and Chopin and Paganini, you had to look at the setting. Everybody can play like that now, but nobody could play like that. That's such a great way of putting it. That was kind of moving a little bit. <laughs> That's yeah, right. I'm crying here. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, somebody should teach a class on it someday about what the relevance was. Not even mentioning his craftsmanship, you know. Hmm. I think that perfectly leads to the next question because I think it was partly answered. Generally, when did you get into comics and with that realize that it was your career? I tried to get into comics for a long time before I'd actually managed to do it. I drew comics in high school with my buddies, and the goal was just to make each other laugh in class or whatever, or between classes. We did it a lot, but we drew these cartoons a lot, and we idolized comic books and editorial cartoonists and cartoonists in the newspaper. There were newspapers when I was in high school. We had this thing called paper and money, <laughs> carburetors, hope. God, it's like listening to your grandfather talk. Anyway, so I, we started drawing in high school to make each other laugh, and then I just kept doing that at home. But I went off and did other things in a middle-aged crisis of some sort and decided, you know, I really want to draw for a living. I've run out of other options and I'm not happy. And this is what I want to do. So that was about 93, 92. And I spent a year checking out the comic scene and seeing all the indie guys and girls. There was a whole big brat pack of them at the time. You know, even Neil Gaiman was in that brat pack because he was a new guy. Yeah, yeah. And there was Jeff and, well, all those guys. And uh, they inspired me. 
And then I met Jeff and he went to dinner with him. I went over to the local store signing. They went to dinner, invited me. I grilled him at dinner. How are you doing it? How do you do it? How does it work? Da, da, da. And he just kind of helped me a lot. He was very open to talking to me over the course of the year as I got my book together and kind of got started that way, you know, in my 30s when I started that. So I was really late. Most people have their act together and get in in their 20s, you know. I, that's so admirable. I'm a late bloomer. That gives us hope for us other late bloomers. Yeah, yeah but... never, never. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of us, we have a lot to process and get through before we really kind of figure out what we want to do. Probably spend the first 10 years of your adult life just trying to please other people and figure out the roles and crap like that. And then you decide, okay, well, I know I don't want to work at, you know, that day job anymore. I decided that's not for me. You just, you just kind of have to look at all your options first before you pick. That's what I did. And then you made your own. Uh, then I made my own, yeah. Which leads to a, a great question. Well, you led into my question that I was dying to know. When Strangers in Paradise first launched, it launched under Homage Comics, which you helped found. And it was published under Image, correct? I actually had a run of Strangers before that. So okay. I started in 93 as with a small publisher in San Antonio, and they did a little mini series. And then I self-published uh, 12 issues by myself. And then the industry started imploding with the distributors going away. So that was the buzz at San Diego that year. And everybody was looking for a big publisher umbrella to go hide under because we were losing our indie distributors. And Image was taking everybody in, anybody they wanted. You know, It was kind of like draft day for the NFL. That's San Diego. <laughs> And that was about 95 or so or 96. So anyway, I got the offer to go to Jim Lee's company, Homage. He had Wildstorm already operating. They were doing great. Jim was doing great. And he wanted to start this indie line, Homage. And I was one of the people that he invited. And I said, yes, because I was losing all my business platforms. I was losing all my distributors. I stayed there for a year until uh, Diamond kind of settled down and everything calmed down. And I realized uh, I really like self-publishing, so I went back to that. So it was because of Jim Lee's invite that you, you went to Homage and underneath the Image umbrella. Because it's interesting, the snapshot of Image at the time, almost everything they were putting out was superheroes. Yeah. And Strangers was far from that. So yeah. like Fantagraphics was just starting up around then. Kitchen Sink was still a thing. And like in my head, Strangers would be so much better in those worlds. But it makes sense that Jim invited you in and that's the reason. But yeah, it was probably... If I'm not mistaken, it was the first non like superhero book that Image ever had their hands on. I don't know, because one of the other books was Leave It to Chance. And that was around that time. Yeah. Yeah. And Leave It to Chance was just an adventurer girl. I don't think she had any powers. I don't remember that, but I don't remember either. But I uh, didn't even think about yeah. that title. Yeah. It was an adventure book. And I think the other one was the Ralph Bakshi book that was supposed to happen. And then maybe one other Astro City. Astro City, of course, yeah. Mm. That was their huge hit, and it went on for quite a while. And it's coming back. And, and well-deserved, huge fan base. Wow. Kurt was on fire. They got him away from uh, Marvel because things were changing. I think it was at Marvel or DC. He and, was at Marvel at the time, yeah. Yeah, things were changing and very shifting ground, and I can't speak for those guys, but that San Diego was networking on fire. I would have been a fly on the wall there. Yes, you did want to be standing next to every booth listening to all those conversations. I mean, there was lots and lots of deals and survival talk and all kinds of, it was a very exciting time, actually. We were scared to death, but it was a lot happening. Live fast, take chances. Leave it to chance. A question I like to ask generally is about scripts and the process of doing it. But with you, it's a little unique because you're often writing them for yourself with your independent work. If you could just tell us a little bit about how your script writing works when you're doing it for yourself. I used to write scripts like they look like tv scripts you know it'd be 60 pages for a 30 minute uh, tv show using final draft you know so you have mostly dialogue and scant panel direction i used to do that write in final draft and then i just got down to taking an outline note you know like i was outlining a short story and that's kind of where i am now i have a notebook where i will outline uh, the issue and i make notes of the problems that i'm bringing from the previous issues what do i need to resolve now how much time do i have left and if it's like a 10 issue miniseries that kind of thing because we're on camera here i'm showing you all my notes right now don't look how organized <laughs> they are but yeah sometimes i just have the whole idea in my head 
and I just dive in and just go. I don't know if those issues are any better or worse, but I do a lot of writing. I know what I want on the page and then I get started on it. And then if I get a better idea that throws it all away, I will pursue the better idea. And I have redone pages. And once I even redid an entire book, twice I've redone an entire book. Oh, wow. Because I got finished with it and thought I had a better idea. Will those two trash no. issues ever see the light of day? You knew where I was going with that. <laughs> I did save a couple of pages that were drawn, but I don't know. It's, it'd be like watching an episode of a TV show, you know, where the weirdest things happen. So, yeah. Since you mentioned that you kind of have it all in your head, that leads me to my next question. When did you decide that you wanted the quote-unquote Terryverse? A lot of your characters cross over into a lot of your own titles. Did you want to do that from way back when, or was it an idea that came to you later on? It kind of got to me from the saying amongst, what do you call it? Not pioneers, but there's a group of people that do well with self-maneuvers and you know, kind of managing to operate inside of a warehouse or whatever. And so there's some nicknames for that. And that's kind of how I felt about it when I got to the the project. I was thinking about the stories and that, you know, last year's was my story, next year's is my story. And I was thinking, it's like, a, I'm like a Terry program, you know, and all the stories are coming out of my brain and fitting into the middle of an action story, you know. So I began thinking of the Terry verse and it just kind of made sense to me. That's what I do. I just think of it as a Terry verse that all my characters live in. So I don't know if you've caught on, but I'm definitely more of a modern commercial kind of fan. Not that I'm proud to say that. And Jeremiah is a wealth of knowledge of things <laughs> beyond his age. But a question that he came up with that I stole from him because I too was curious is the choice of black and white and why you go with it over color. Now, even more so familiarizing myself, I see how great it is that way and how it does tell the story better, but I do want your answer to that. Well, naturally, I've always worked in black and white because I've always just drawn with the pen and paper and from high school on. So it's really the fastest way to work in time-wise. I don't have to draw it and then color it. So it saves time and money not to do the color. But it also, you know, saves me the scheduling because imagine... If I had to ink it and then I'm coloring it or somebody else colors it, so they have it for an additional length of time. And you have to back time that kind of scheduling, you know? I mean, how long does it take to get something out? Versus if I draw it, I can draw a page a day and I could actually be publishing a page a day, which is how I've managed to make my schedule all these years of putting a book out every six weeks. It's worked out really well for me to have it in black and white. And all the stuff that I used to love was in black and white anyway. I love the indie stuff and the underground comics and all that, you know. I liked it. Are you a big Crumb fan or? Yeah, yeah, I was and very much in high school. As long as he was productive and all that, I very much liked it. And when he stopped doing the stories, he went into a lot of other stuff that he did, whether it's entire card collections of jazz musicians or whoever, you know. So he went on to do a lot of other stuff, but I loved his stories, you know, that we all read in school. Are you a big fan of EC Comics at all? I know it was before your time, but have you gone back and, and read those? And is there any particular artist that sticks out to you that you enjoy a lot from that time period? Yeah, there were. And I, I don't know if I can remember the names, but I did love EC Comics and the storytelling and the beautiful rendering and the pen and ink. I think I learned a lot of pen and ink style from that kind of comic, as opposed to the more regulated approach for mainstream comics. But if you go to horror comics or indie comics, you get all kinds of different ideas for inking and object rendering and things like that. So yeah, loved it. And then of course, European stuff. It wasn't easy to get when I was younger, but I was lucky enough to live overseas for a while when I was 11 and 12. And that got me started and helped me know what to look for when I got back. Because you lived for a time in Africa and England. No, I didn't live in England, but I spent time there. Oh. So yeah, everywhere I went, I was looking for comics, you know, back at that age. And even the cartoon strips, you know, the Dennis the Menace that they had in England is different than here. And all the local stuff, you know, some of it is beautiful. I mean, they had beautiful adventure strips and real looking stuff, you know, picture James Bond, then a female version, and then all this other stuff. So there was a lot to look at and be inspired by. Probably just because you're good friends with them. But I'm curious, you could have had pretty much any 
superhero artists do the superhero pages of Strangers in Paradise. Why did you choose Jim Lee? Because it was his company. That was the first issue for homage. And he offered to help. And he said, you know, if you like, I'll do a cover, which is really incredibly nice because you realize, you know, what that means. Of course, it's sales. And the whole time that I was publishing Strangers in Paradise through homage, all my sales were up at least 3000 per issue. That's the power of Jim's audience. And so yeah, it was just one of those really, really nice things that he offered to do. So I said, what about I start off with a little hero sequence and then it, it's a dream and it converts back to my story. And he said, yeah, sure. And, you know, I think I did like five pages and he very kindly drew it and very kindly let his real inker ink it and it just looked fantastic. And he's really a nice guy that way. He's so productive. He's so much energy, so nice. You know, I just can't say enough nice things about him as a guy and as an artist. He certainly ran that business to in a brilliant way and made something good of it. You know, if you think about it, a lot of the other indie image people have come and gone or just it off into other things. And Jim just stayed with it. He really loves it. And he's rose to literally the top right now as mm -hmm. president of DC. And it, his work really speaks for itself. And Obviously, he's a fantastic artist, so why wouldn't you want him on your book? But I was really interested because you could have really chose anyone, but luckily you had Jim there, and that's such an awesome thing of him to do and such an awesome part of the beginning of that series. So Tells you what kind of guy he is. I mean, he didn't say, I'll do it for three grand a page. He just said, I'll do it. And so, yeah, I mean, he's just an incredible guy. He really is. And we still say hi to each other when I see him. He's a nice guy. It's awesome. Yeah, the real thing. Generally speaking... Who are you a fan of in the industry? Nah. <laughs> Cut it right there. Lord have mercy. No, I'm a huge fanboy. I just had to be smart. I've been friends a long time with Fabio Moon. So I love his work. I love the work of Frank Cho. I think he's really talented. And he's such a neat guy. I like him so much. You know, I've had him over the house and everything. So saw those pictures on Instagram. I was like, oh my God, the two of them in the same room. <laughs> he's a cool guy. He's very funny. I really like Scotty Young. I think his work is brilliant. I like Bill Sienkiewicz. I kind of want to die and be famous just so I can see the, the mural that Sienkiewicz 20 minutes after my death. Yeah, you could fake your death and it was worth spending the rest of your life in prison just to get your portrait done. It's true. I really like Mike Mignola. I think he's brilliant what he's done with his world his one world that he's created in terms of other people though there's a kind of like a disney animator artist on instagram her name is uh, lois h l-o-i-s-h she has over two million followers and she is the best at all of that disney-esque looking beautiful animated looking art cartooning art she's the best at it there's a ton of people that do that She's the best. And then a longtime favorite that I've always loved is the guy who did Spirit of Wonder from Japan, Kenji Su. I think that's how you say his name. I love that book, Spirit of Wonder. It's from the 90s. And they actually even made a Japanese movie about it. If you've never checked that out, check it out. Top of my list right now. And one guy I've never been able to get over. I mean, I loved him in the beginning and I love him now. I mean, in the beginning, I mean like 80s, 90s, is uh, Hajime Sorayama. He does the robot, the lady chrome robots. You've seen, I'm sure you've seen the mm -hmm. pictures. Yeah. He's back high profile again. For some reason, he's resurging in Japan because they have exhibits of his all over Japan now. And he has some sort of renaissance thing going on and the new stuff looks fantastic they've got these big bigger than life versions of his great art these real chrome robots all over the place in tokyo and stuff like that so it's really worth checking him out on instagram and seeing those photos i recommend him awesome yeah, yeah definitely going to check out some of those some of those i'm surprised i didn't even know and they're very inspiring i mean these these are very creative people you know, and they're doing their own thing. To switch gears just slightly, you've got to play at the big two occasionally at Marvel and DC. And one of the things that you did at Marvel was Runaways. And you took over Runaways after two runs of Brian K. Vaughn's. Was that a difficult thing to do to try to transition Runaways into your own? Do you wish you could have stayed with the book longer? Is there anything else that you wish you could have done with it? No, it was kind of like house sitting. You know, like somebody gives you their very valuable car and you're supposed to take care of it for a short time. That's what it felt like. A lot of responsibility. Don't mess it up. It's not yours. People like the car, not the guy driving it. So it was like, it very much felt like that. You know, the audience didn't come to see you. 
they, it's a loyal audience to this character base. I felt that responsibility not to mess it up, like it belonged to somebody else. He worked a long time to establish the book, and he had to move on to other things by contract. And I was very fortunate to get the chance to step in, but I felt like a substitute teacher. People were not there because I was there. They were there because of the last, previous three years of great story. So I worked closely with the editors and then ran the scripts by them every time. And they were kind of making sure that I didn't tank the thing on my watch. So you're always aware of that. It's kind of like house sitting is what it's like. And the guy has a really expensive car in the garage. But you just don't want to hurt and ruin anything, you know. So I tried to be very careful and my story was self-contained. I can't go change the characters or have them do anything life-changing or kill one off or anything, you know. It's kind of like you're babysitting someone else's kid. If you get the job of writing, say, like six Batmans, you can't submit a script that says issue two, Batman dies. But the Runaways were such a, almost a niche part of the universe at the time. You probably could have established a couple. I mean, villains' kids are easy to find, I guess, in an idea. You can bring in some problem. So I brought in a problem and they had to deal with it. But now it's kind of like saying, okay, Jeremiah, I need you to write the next six episodes of Friends. Oh boy. It's exactly like that. That's what it is. On your second script, you say, okay, in this one, you know, Jenny dies. We need a meeting. You have a lot of responsibility when you're messing with something somebody else worked really hard to establish. And I guess it really is that way if you go to a DC Marvel mainstream book that's been all around a long time. But it's easier to forget, you know, because it's been through so many incarnations. And But that one, there was only one. So don't mess it up, you know. So pretending that there weren't limitations or concerns, as you just have described, speaking of the big two, what characters would you want to play in their sandbox? You know, really just no rules. What characters from, I guess if you want to do one from Marvel, DC, who would you really like to write or draw or both at the same time? At D I, I have my answer. At DC, oh, I, it's the same answer I've had for years. At DC, I would I would write Supergirl, and I would give her a life. You know, <laughs> she needs an apartment, a wardrobe, friends. What does she eat at lunch? What does what is her hobby? Does she listen to this podcast? Is it the only podcast she listens to? You know, like when does she ever have a love life? Has anybody ever kissed her? This also means we can't be dealing with some robot android from the planet Z. I mean, the real Supergirl who I, apparently this very false rumor that she died and the whole DC universe warned her a long time ago. <laughs> That's a nasty rumor. I'll tell you why it doesn't work and what really happened and why she's back. <laughs> okay, now that I've totally saved DC, the uh, Marvel book that I'd like to write would be Gwen Stacy, all about Gwen Stacy. You know, I really thought that the, the story between Peter Parker and Gwen was great. And then when he lost her, he was in the Marvel Universe. He was so depressed that his only comfort came from the other. We're not even going to mention her name right this second. So he ended up with, you know, plan B. So I was thinking, you know, what if the real Gwen actually survived and got away and she comes back and, you know, are there something about it? There's more to the story, you know? I just can't see getting rid of Gwen Stacy. They were crazy about each other. And he had nothing in common with the redheaded girl. I mean, that was plan B. I mean, it's, it, that's like deciding you're going to hang out with, you know, somebody else in high school, you know? Thanks to the smokers crowd. Yeah. That's what it was, yeah. I mean, they didn't have anything in common before. And then she was the only girl left, and they just kind of forced them together for him and the girl he's with now. But anyway, that's all over. I mean, he's gone and he's retired and we've got new kids on the block. So if we bring Gwen back, it's too late for Peter, but the new kid, the new Spider-Man, I don't know, maybe there's some Gwen DNA somewhere. Everybody leaves DNA J somewhere. Jack somewhere. <laughs> Jackal has some DNA. And eventually we're gonna get a Spider-Man smart enough to do some DNA stuff. So let's get it on. Great, great answers. Both great. I'd read them. Seeing you on Supergirl would be absolutely phenomenal. Because you, you did a little bit with Batgirl, right? I mm -hmm. thought you were going to want to continue that a little bit. But the idea of you doing Supergirl is just fascinating to me. Because, yeah, she really hasn't had a life. There hasn't been many issues where it focuses around her personality and, her, like, existing. No she, life. Yeah, she's just... Been, I hate to say it this way, but she's basically a, an object. She's basically a weapon. And that's how she's always been portrayed. And unfortunately, hopefully, until you get your hands on it, will always be. So how come, you know, every single thing about, say, some of the other characters, 
that have big, long, complex stories. We don't really know anything about her. She just shows up and fights something exotic in an exotic locale and has very little life. She's usually in uniform and stuff like that. Have you ever seen her make breakfast or sleep late or visit somebody or, you know, she has no life. And that's what makes you care about somebody. I would love to see your take on that one day, hopefully. To switch gears back to your own Terryverse, is there any more development on the Rachel Rising TV show? Or is that in just production hell? It is actually completely unclaimed. Ooh. It's not even in uh, production hell. It was with somebody and then they let it go. They didn't do it. And it was not because of the property, but because of these places that, you know, they acquire rights and stuff like that. The personnel change every year. People are always shifting and moving up and all that. So the person that options your book may be gone in two years. And once they're gone, the next person doesn't want anything that person had. They bring their own list. If that one person that options your book doesn't get it somewhere within his time period, that's it. You're done. So that's what happened. You know, I, it was with a person or two, they moved on and the thing lapsed and now I've got it back. So my plan is I actually have three other things optioned and I'm going to hope that some of those things get going and then somebody's going to say, do you have any more? And I'm going to say, oh yeah, I have this one. It's only $1 billion. Last time you got it for $20. Now it's a billion. You guys can uh, negotiate that deal for me. I'll get right on that. I heard from a little birdie and I'll, I'll give the shout out to the little birdie. I have a really good friend named Russell Burlingame. And mm -hmm. yeah. he let me know that you might have something in the works for Kickstarter. Is something going on there? I wanted to do a Kickstarter because all of my pals are doing one. When I finished my last series, Serial, I thought, okay, now I'm going to do a Kickstarter. But I really couldn't think of the right appropriate project. And, and I pitched like 20 ideas to Robin. And she said, I don't think that's quite right. We couldn't figure it out, to tell you the truth. And whatever I do, I'd have to start from scratch. So if I did a Kickstarter this month, I couldn't deliver it for a year. That's not good. So it never really kind of gelled. And then just recently, like within the last 36 hours, I decided to start a new series instead. I've been dying to do this certain series and I've been dying to do it for quite a while. And I just decided, let's just do that instead. So I resolicited with Diamond and I'm launching a new series in June or July. Very cool. Yeah. I'm excited to see that. Me too. Yeah. The Kickstarter, I, I think those things are great, but yeah, obviously here in the studio talking about it between ourselves, I clearly did not have the right thing. And some of the people who do Kickstarters have been working on something for quite a while. Like, you know, well, all <laughs> most of them, yeah. Yeah. So, and I don't have that. I'd have to be starting from scratch on it because I just finished a regular series. I would have to start from scratch on the Kickstarter and it would take a year for me to do a trade and that just didn't quite feel right. So I'm better off going back to a periodical. But one day, if ever, are we ever going to get a strip? Because hmm. you've wanted to do a strip for a long time. Now's a good time to do a strip. Where does There's it go? this little thing called Substack. Substack. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's a possibility. Everyone's doing Substack right now. And a strip would work, in my opinion, a strip would work really, really well on Substack. I mean, I get emails every single day from Brian K. Vaughn and Chip Zdarsky and other people that I subscribe to on Substack. I'd love to get an email from you every day. Oh. Terry Moore artwork and Terry Moore story in my inbox every single morning. Yeah. That'd be wonderful. I would love to have that offered out there to everybody too. I would love to do something like that on a regular basis. So I will think about that. That's going to haunt me all night. And if you ever do a strip and you need a character, Jeremiah is a fine name. Okay. <laughs> I want to give you any remaining minutes you want to give us with anything you can share about what you're working on and of course upcoming projects that everyone needs to be looking out for what i'm doing right now and have been doing for the last couple of two to three weeks is sketches and i'm doing these sketches for this big deal art sale that we're having on my website come april one two three that weekend and so far i have i think 64 sketches that i've done pencil sketches there's the ones you're posting on instagram right yeah They're yeah gorgeous yeah thank you oh i'm thank so you. jealous so yeah i've been doing that and those will be for sale and then we pulled 
like 150 pages of original art from the archive, the buckets you see behind me. Those are oh. all original pages from my series. Oh. I have four great big buckets full of envelopes of all those original art and not all of it's been seen. So Robin went through and tried to pull a lot of pages that have never been out and those will be for sale. So this is on my website, abstractstudiocomics.com and we're going to have a big sale April 1, 2, 3. And that day, uh, starting April 1, we will accept the European. We haven't been able to take European orders for a while, but now we're going to start again on April 1. So it'll be a worldwide sale, and I have these sketches for sale. I'm going to keep doing sketches until the time comes. I'm really excited to see that sale and hopefully that I can grab something. In one of the sketches that you posted, you have a quote, and I just want to just touch on it for a second, because when I read it, I was like, wow, that hit is you were talking about Francine and Kachu from Strangers in Paradise. If you haven't read it yet, it's okay. It's a book. Books wait for you to be ready for them. That's such a, oh my God. And finding stories at the right times in life are, are very important. And like Strangers, I guarantee has helped a lot of people. Is there anything that you would say to someone who hasn't read Strangers, who's afraid to pick it up? Cause it's not a superhero book. Like what would you tell them about Strangers, you yourself, why they should read it? I think the people that I see reading Strangers are every kind of person. But one thing that they do have in common is they have a love life or they want a love life. So it does not tend to resonate with a 12 year old, but it does tend to resonate with anybody who's been dumped or rejected or has fallen in love with somebody from afar and doesn't dare talk to them. And then there's other characters in there that have struggle with falling in love with somebody of the same sex. What do we do about it? Especially if the other person doesn't feel that way. So I'm just really trying to get into the into all those situations that happen between the age of 18 and 28 when you're really looking for and these are all the variations the the cast of strangers is pretty big so there's so many variations on falling in love thank you for telling me you love me but i'm sorry i don't feel that way or you know i wish i could but i can't right now or okay i'm free wait where did you go every variation is in there and it meant so much to me to get all that off of my brain i mean clearly i just pulled from everything I ever heard and saw in school and in my 20s. It's all in there. And it felt so great to follow through on it and watch these people win for once. The thing about Strangers is it's a long story and I, it really has time to delve into all the reasons why it can't work out. It shouldn't work out. Oh, there's a little glimmer of hope. Oh, look, this is wonderful. Oh, fantastic. We're inseparable. So it's, you know, like a dream come true for on so many levels of, you know, all these different types of pairings and pairing up in relationships. So it's really a good book to read if you're lonely and feel like it's just never going to happen. You can find your avatar in this story and watch how they handle it. You know, it's not one of those short made for TV movies where they fix it in 20 minutes. I mean, it's a long series, but the one thing that is on every page really is hope. And that's the one thing that keeps people going. You get up every morning thinking, well, you know, maybe today it'll work out. And that's why we keep getting up. And I've kept that feeling throughout the book. And that was the most important thing to me was hope. And then there's just a resolution and there's love. And it just kind of makes you happy to be alive, you know, that you're glad for them. And it gives you confidence about your own life. That's Strangers in Paradise. Somebody shoot a rocket or something. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on and talking with us. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure. I would put your pencils up against any other artist in the industry, just with the way that you do them. Wow. Thank you so much. That that means a lot because it's a big industry. Thank you. Yeah. Everything on Instagram has been beautiful. Really. Absolutely fantastic. I can't thank you enough. Very insightful. I love that we had some parallel structure there. Started with a little lack of hope and ending with a little hope. So really <laughs> fantastic. Thank you guys. Thanks for having me on and let me talk about all this stuff. I, I love that you're helping me get the, my little universe out to more people. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to see more of the sketches. Hopefully I can get one. I'm very jealous of Russell's because he has it like right when you walk into his office. He has a sketch of catch you on the front of a like a pickup truck i think oh, yeah, yeah yeah she's she gone through in my a face couple all the pickups. time <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> she has an old pickup and you can see it in the story when she buys it yeah she likes the old pickup